Well, I think, uh, as you may know, or as you just saw, we are currently in a series, now just in our second week, um, looking at the person and the work of the Holy Spirit. And our objective in, in the course of these nine weeks that we have together is, is for us to grow in our awareness of the Holy Spirit, but also to grow in our ability to live according to the Holy Spirit. And so this week, as I was preparing, I was just spending time thinking about what does that mean? I mean, how, how do we grow in our awareness of the Holy Spirit? How do, we, how do we grow in our ability to live according to the Holy Spirit? A couple of thoughts came to mind for me. First, I think we do exactly what we're here to do now. Why we have gathered in this place to look into God's word, to, to look at what Jesus and, and the New Testament and the Old Testament, what it all teaches us about the Holy Spirit, about who he is and why he's been sent. And we're going to continue today to look at Jesus teaching to the disciples as he's preparing them. He's preparing them for his, his eventual death and burial and, and resurrection and, and ascension. And, and so he continues to teach them on what life is going to be like once he's gone. And as he does so, he tells them about the Helper who will be sent following his departure. And so we can anticipate or expect or look forward to this same activity in our own lives and, and the church together. Additionally, I think that we, we pay attention. And, and here's what I mean by that. I think in order for us to grow in our awareness of the Holy Spirit in our lives, we have to recognize his activity or his work in our lives. I, I was thinking again about this earlier this week, about how often I think the Holy Spirit is, is working and moving in the course of my life, but I am largely oblivious to it. As we were talking in my small group on Friday evening, it, it's, I compared it to like a, a appliance or like a water heater. It's, it's constantly there doing its job, but I never think about it. I turn on the faucet, hot water's there, and I turn it off. The only time I ever think about my hot water heater is when it stops working, right? It's behind the scenes doing its job. But if we begin to notice and pay attention to its activity, we grow in our understanding of, of what he's doing. And I want to be more alert. I, I, I want to be conscious of the reality that the Holy Spirit is working in my life and to identify his activity as, as exactly that, which ultimately then leads us to this third portion of this, which is simply our ability then to align ourselves or to partner with his work in our lives. And this is really instrumental when we talk about what does it mean to live according to the Holy Spirit. See, I think there's a big difference for you and I between being, being dragged somewhere or being led somewhere. Is that the second implies a sense of, of partnership, agreement, and, and participation. So as we grow in our awareness of his activity in our lives, then we, we have the opportunity to submit ourselves to his work and to his leading. So this is, this is what we're after in, in these nine weeks together, what we're praying for as a church. And by the way, again, I mentioned this last week, but along in that effort, in each of our services, as we're in here opening up God's word and learning together, there's a team of people in the room next door in our office space who are just praying towards this end. For us, They're asking God to do this thing amongst this community here and in our lives individually. And they'll continue to do that over the course of these nine weeks. So again, last week we looked at, at Jesus' conversation with his disciples in the upper room. We talked about, as, as we saw from Jesus' words, we talked about the promise of the Holy Spirit. We talked about the person of the Holy Spirit, which is really very critical in our whole understanding of, of who the Holy Spirit is and what he does, because we, we need to understand that our ability to, to um, partner with his work is really a relationship. Because he is a person, not this arbitrary, impersonal force that's just floating out there, our, our ability to connect with him is a relational ability. And then we talked about the presence of the Holy Spirit, the reality that he is here with us, dwelling amongst us right now. And we continue now, this morning, we are going to look at, at Jesus' continued instructions, but now Jesus is going to begin to articulate 
demonstrate for us what the Holy Spirit, what he's sending this helper to do, um, both in the world and, and in our lives. If you are my age or older, you have, like me, survived the digital revolution, right? In the course of our lifetimes, we have gone through things like landlines and analog and black and white TV to, to everything streaming and cell phones and, and the world that we live in now. And most of us have managed that transition fairly well. For some of, of those who were born, um, who are older than me, that transition has not always been easy. And one of those people is my, my grandfather. He's 92 years old now, just a great guy. Um, he's always sort of been excited about technology. He's always kind of liked it, but, but it's always been difficult for him. For example, one, one summer when we were driving as a family down to South Carolina for our vacation, uh, my grandpa was next to my brother in the front seat. Jared was driving, grandpa was sitting up there. My grandma is back in the very last row with some of her great grandkids, is where she loved to be, sitting back there talking with them, and they had gotten new cell phones, or gotten cell phones, it could have been their first ones. And so my grandma decided that she wanted to check in with my uncle, who's driving separately, who is also named Don, like my, my grandpa. So she goes on to dial up my, my uncle, and as she does so, she accidentally dials my grandpa, who's sitting in the front row of the seat. Now both of them are about half deaf at, at this time <laughs> of life, too. So my grandpa answers the phone, and, and here's my grandma, but he doesn't understand what she's saying, and he's kind of yelling at her. And my grandma's in the back seat, yelling at my, who she believes to be my uncle at the time. And eventually, my grandpa just sort of hangs up. He's like, I can never understand her on these things. And all of this is happening in the exact same van. <laughs> like, they're just going back and forth. Um, they had all the technology, all the power, all the ability in the world. They just didn't understand it, what it does and how to use it. My grandpa always loved um, new computers. He would always say he had this little business that he, he ran after he retired from Ohio State. And, um, and he always used to say, you know, I, I, we got this new computer with all the bells and whistles. And, and he would sit there for about a week. But inevitably, one week later, he would be typing at his typewriter. Because that's what he knew. And that's what he understood. He had all this ability, all this, this these resource that was available to him. But, but he went back to what he knew. So what happens when we live this way as Christians? When we have this promise that Jesus has delivered on that's available to us and he's going to do all these incredible things. And yet we, we sort of resort back to what we know and, and all of this, this power and work is sitting there on the sidelines being under, underutilized or, or worse, ignored. See, what if it's our lack of understanding that is preventing us from tapping into, into what Jesus is promising us when he tells us he's going to send an advocate and what he's come to do? To do so, we'd be missing out on all that's possible, and certainly we'd be missing out on what Jesus attends for us as his followers. So let's turn together now. We're going to continue in this upper room discourse, but now we're going to look at John chapter 16. We were in John chapter 14 last week. We're going to kind of work our way through these nine verses together, and I'm going to start in verse 7, which I alluded to last week, um, and we're going to look at this just a bit, a bit more today. This is Jesus talking to his disciples, and he says, Nevertheless, I tell you the truth, it is to your advantage that I go away. For if I do not go away, the Helper will not come to you, but if I go, I will send him to you. Again, we, we talked about this last week when we were talking about the promise of the Holy Spirit. But I think I, I want to start here by, by just acknowledging and recognizing that Jesus' words here to his disciples had to sound ridiculous to them. And I think it, if we're honest with ourselves, it almost feels a bit ridiculous to us as well at times. That Jesus would say that it's to our advantage that he's going away. I think of it like this. Have you ever had those moments in your life when you're, maybe you're reading in the New Testament or you're hearing stories and you see their incredible faith just being lived out on the pages of Scripture and you think, like, man, if I, had to, if I had the opportunity to see what they saw, if I watched Jesus 
heal leprosy, if I, if I saw him raise Lazarus from the dead, it's almost like they have this unfair advantage in their extraordinary faith. And I, and I, I get that in part. But I think Jesus is saying something here that, that, that we need to hear. Je- Jesus is saying to us, it's, it is, and he says this to them, it's to your advantage that I go away, that the helper will come to you. See, essentially, Jesus is telling his, his first followers that the Holy Spirit living in you is greater than me walking with you or beside you. And of course, the same is true for us. The disciples were able to spend these, this time that they had with Jesus, watching him do all of these incredible things. And now with the arrival of the Holy Spirit, he's saying Christ is present with all of us, all believers, all the time. We, we have a greater advantage. It is greater to have God living in us than it is to have him walking beside us. It's to our advantage, Jesus says. Because now we're going to begin to see what it is that the Spirit is doing, at least in part. Jesus continues now. This is, again, back in John chapter 16, picking it up in verse 8. He says, And when he comes, he will convict the world concerning sin and righteousness and judgment. Concerning sin, because they do not believe in me. Concerning righteousness, because I go to the Father, and you will see me no longer. Concerning judgment, because the ruler... Of, the, of this world is judged. So Jesus here is he's pointing them forward to what's about to happen in terms of the crucifixion and the eventual resurrection. But as it relates to this unique work of the Holy Spirit, Jesus is clear. He's saying the Holy Spirit's job, he comes to convict. He comes to convict, which is not something that we're always huge fans of. I don't, I don't know if you've ever experienced this, but if you're Sometimes late at night, you're catching the evening news or something like that before you go to bed. And, and they can be so dramatic sometimes about how they present stuff. But there, I've seen a couple times where it's like there's stories where it's like uh, there's new research out. And what you're doing right now could be killing you or whatever. And they'll talk about how like a, a poor diet or a lack of exercise and, and the impact that that's having on us. And first off, you're sort of like, did we really need research, new research to tell us that? Like we, we've known this for some times. But Secondly, you're sitting there with like a bowl of ice cream in your pajamas watching TV, right? And it's like, this isn't what I want to hear. This is, and you do what anybody does. You grab the remote and put something else on, right? We love to tune that sort of thing out in our lives. But Jesus here is saying that this is a specific role of the Holy Spirit. He, He says that he is one of his fundamental jobs in our lives is to convict the world concerning sin and righteousness and judgment. It's the job of the Holy Spirit to expose our need. It's the job of the Holy Spirit to inform us that the way we live, when we live apart from grace, that that is killing us. See, culturally, again, this this work of the Holy Spirit isn't necessarily widely appreciated. But I think that's because it's misunderstood or misconstrued. It, it gets expressed as being oppressive or, or repressive. Whatever, whatever would restrain us from what we believe is, is good for us or what we want. And so we kind of have built up this mantra that, that it's, it's not right for somebody to tell us. That we like to be sort of the final authority of those things in our lives and in our culture. See, but the Holy Spirit's work of conviction in our lives and the world isn't just about making us feel guilty, although it might include that. It's not even just about mere knowledge of what is right and and what is wrong, although that might happen. It's not even just a a foreboding about a future judgment. It's it's more than all of that. See, Jesus is is tying us, and, and we talked about this last week. If you recall, we looked at this word, this Greek word that's translated helper. The word is is paraclete in the Greek. It's a legal term. And and so the Holy Spirit is our advocate. He is our our defense attorney against our accuser. But now Jesus is demonstrating this role of the Holy Spirit as, as one who is prosecutor or judge. 
He's, he's on the offense. And for what purpose? If the, if the Holy Spirit is acting as the prosecuting attorney in the world, what is his desired result? See, ultimately, he seeks to expose sin in order to, to convict people, to convince them that they need a Savior. He, he, and you look at the verse that, that describes this, his fundamental role. Look at verse 9. Again, he says, the, the Spirit convicts concerning sin because they do not believe in me. His work of conviction is one in the world and in our lives where he exposes our need for Jesus. He, he, he de desires to convince us of, of our need of a defender, of a savior. And when we put our faith in Jesus for the forgiveness of sins, it says that we receive the paraclete, that we're sealed by the spirit and he becomes our advocate so the holy spirit's role in our lives becomes one of of this defense attorney for us he, he becomes the one who is so at first he is exposing our need making us aware and then when we place our faith in jesus he is defending us against the very things that he made us aware need to be absent in our lives the very things that are killing us see the holy spirit's work of conviction in our lives is an act of love it's him making us aware that of our need to turn to Jesus. And there's an implication here for us. If you're, if you're here this morning and you're a Christian, I just want us to take a moment, and you've been the benefactor of this role of the Holy Spirit in your life. If, if we take this seriously, if we, if we believe that the Holy Spirit is at work in the world if, if he is convicting people of sin, if he's convincing them of their need, their own inability to, to satisfy the greatest need of their life, and if we believe that he's good at his job, then as the church, we need to be ready. The, the, the response here is that there is work of the Holy Spirit going on all around us all the time where he's exposing people's needs and the subsequent reality that we have to be aware of is that then there's opportunity to speak into that there's opportunity in the midst of that moment to be able to speak grace into people's conviction there's opportunity when they're searching and trying to find out how do i resolve this issue in my life to be able to tell them about jesus to say i have the solution i know the answer to your greatest problem we need to be ready to tell them about Jesus, to tell them about our defender, to tell them about the work of the Holy Spirit. And by the way, this does not, yes, the Holy Spirit will become our defender, as we've talked about, as Jesus has already given us that. But his work of conviction won't stop at the point of salvation. He, he will always work to expose things in our life that are, are sin, and because they're sin, they're hurting us, and because they're hurting us and he loves us, he wants to remove them. He'll continue to do that in and through us. And it's his act of love so that we seek forgiveness, that we seek healing because he loves us. Jesus now continues to define this role of the Holy Spirit back in John chapter 16, picking it up in verse 12. He says, I still have many things to say to you, but you cannot bear them now. When the spirit of truth comes, he will guide you into all truth, for he will not speak on his own authority, but whatever he speaks, he will, what, whenever he hears, he will speak, for he will declare to you the things that are to come. The things that are to come. Here, here again, Jesus now reveals that one of the primary fundamental roles of the Holy Spirit is to guide us to truth. The Holy Spirit guides us to truth. I am, um, was wrestling with how to how do you articulate this how do you how do you illustrate or or get us to think about what this looks like um and i found this this short video that i want to show you this morning because i think it, it captures at least in my head this role of, of of the holy spirit in his life check this out we got the baby's first pair of glasses Christian. Christian. Open your eyes, buddy. Hi. 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 Hi, Munchkin. 
I love that video, and I, 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 think, I think you get the point. Like, what Jesus is telling us about the Holy Spirit is that he enables us to see. He opens our eyes to God's truth and to understanding in, an, in a way that we in and of ourselves are unable to do. And he's telling his disciples that this is what he's sending his helper in order to do. Then there's, there's a couple of implications here for this. First, I think in the, in the immediate context that Jesus is saying to those original disciples in that place, he is, he's preparing them for the work that they are going to share in as they record the authoritative account of the life and ministry of Jesus. He's, he's telling them that you are going to play this important role. The Holy Spirit is going to remind you of the truth that I've said as you record all of this so that the story will be available to people. He's preparing them to write down the gospel accounts. If you look back in John chapter 14, verse 26, we, we looked at this verse last week. It says, but the helper, the Holy Spirit, when the, whom the Father will send in my name, when he will teach you all the things and bring to your remembrance all that I've said to you. One commentator says it this way. He says, the revelation of Jesus will continue in the community and the spirit paraclete will be the authoritative channel through which he is heard. So, so Jesus is preparing his disciples for, for exactly what they are going to be um, doing in terms of recording and telling the story of Jesus. Additionally, though, I think, and, and you look at verse, um, I didn't write down what verse this is, but he says in there, he will declare to you things that are to come. So he's preparing the church for the role of the Holy Spirit in helping us navigate that which we don't readily understand. For example, one of the clear issues that you see unfolding in, in the New Testament that was totally unpredicted by the disciples was the, the gospel message going out and being received by people who weren't Jewish outside of, of the people of Israel. So as this begins to happen, they, they are looking at and saying, like, how, do we, how do we handle this? How do we navigate this? How do, we, do they need to be circumcised in order to be followers of Jesus? Do they need um, to obey our, our ceremonial laws? Like, what do we do with this? And you see in Acts 10, Peter is, is sent by the Holy Spirit to the house of Cornelius where he preaches the gospel. And Peter is there, one of the, the, the primary voice pieces of the early church, to watch the Holy Spirit fall on Cornelius and fall on his home just as it had then in Pentecost. So there'd be no doubt about the validation of what God was doing and that this was for Gentiles. But then in Acts chapter 15, the church is gathered together and they're trying to wrestle through these decisions and you see God guiding them and how do they integrate Gentiles into the community of followers of Jesus. Again, we, we still, as the church, as, as Christ follows, we're still dependent on the role of the Holy Spirit guiding us into truth, into matters and issues and things that Scripture may not clearly lay out for us. We, we don't have, Scripture didn't lay out all the implications, moral implications of technology and the effects of that. But as a church, we have to be aware of that. We have to be thinking and trusting the Holy Spirit to lead us to wise decisions about the implications of that. The Holy Spirit continues to do this. But I think for fundamentally, and, and where we experience this on a more normative level in our lives, is just as the Holy Spirit is, is used to open our eyes, our ability to understand and to take in the truth of God's word and to apply it in our lives. This is his role. To when we open up, when we stand here and sit here on a Sunday morning and we say, God, what is it you want us to hear this morning? It's the Holy Spirit's ro role to open up our hearts and lives in order to give us understanding into what it is that he's teaching us and showing us and what this looks like in relationship to each other. Have you ever had one of those moments? where you are reading through a passage that maybe you've read a hundred times or you're hearing a sermon that you've heard a hundred times and you walk away and you say, I've never seen that before. I've never seen that. 
Like that, that, that is the work of the Holy Spirit, exposing and opening up our hearts to the truth of God's word so that we can take it in and apply it. This is why I'm so excited about the Intro to the Bible seminar that's going to happen here next Sunday and, and the following Sunday. I think it helps prepare us for that and, and helps us understand how we can do that, how we can be ready for that. Jesus is, is also giving us something of a litmus test here. He's also reminding us that the Holy Spirit will never be in conflict with with Jesus in the truth of God's words. He says, in fact, in the middle of verse 13, he says, he will not speak on his own authority, but whatever he hears, he will speak. So this isn't some individualistic, um, you know, the Holy Spirit delivers to us our own truth sort of thing. This is what it means for me. That's not what he's saying. He's saying the Holy Spirit will always align with what I have said. And whenever we're wrestling with, hey, is the Holy Spirit guiding me in this is this is this what he's teaching me one of the checkpoints that we have is is to to put it through like the biblical filter system does this align with god's word is this align with what we see in in jesus is because if they're not in alignment it's not the holy spirit i can't tell you like how many conversations i've had where somebody has has told me i think the holy spirit's telling me to to leave my family or i think that you know he's like all these things that i'm like i promise you he's not He's not telling you that. The Holy Spirit will always align with Jesus. And then ultimately, look back in chapter 16. And I think this is, a, this is an incredible thing, but he goes on to say, this is verse, uh, verse 14 and 15 now. He will glorify me, for he will take what is mine and declare it to you. And all that the Father has is mine. Therefore, I said that he will take what is mine and declare it to you. You see, the role of the Holy Spirit is to glorify the Son. The role of the Holy Spirit is to glorify the Son. And I love the way this passage is and others like it demonstrate or describe the Holy Spirit as constantly deflecting glory. His his work as it is unfolding in our lives will inevitably reflect back to Jesus. It will reflect back to, to the Father. There's this story in the, the book of Nehemiah that this reminded me of. And, and Nehemiah, maybe you know this story, but Nehemiah and the people of God are living in exile. And Nehemiah gets this report about the condition of Jerusalem. And so he goes and he checks it out and he, he, he sees that it's in, in shambles and his heart's broken. And so he goes to the king and asks, can we send this regiment of people back to restore the wall and the king um, because he's moved by God graciously agrees and they go back and and they take on this monumental task in fact the, the the people around them the surrounding communities aren't excited about Jerusalem having its walls restored and being a a presence there and so they are actively working against it trying to to distract them or to keep them from accomplishing their mission in fact, it says that the, as the people worked day and night, 24 hours a day, they would work with one hand and held a sword in another so that they could defend themselves against their enemies. This wall is completed in, in an astronomically short amount of time. And in chapter 6, there's this passage when the enemies of, of Nehemiah are standing on the outskirts of the city and they see this wall completed. And this is their conclusion. This is verse 16. It says, for they perceived that this work had been accomplished with the help of God. They looked at what happened there and they said, it's like God, God did that. See, this is the role of the Holy Spirit in our lives. This is what I want us to understand as he works himself out, as he, as he convicts us of sin, as, as he guides us to, to truth, as he produces his fruit, the fruit of the gospel in our lives, and we're going to talk more about that, then we become, along with the Holy Spirit, instruments wherein we are reflecting back glory to God, glory to Jesus and his work in our lives. That people can see us, and if they know us, and they know the the transformation that's happening in our lives, that that's not us doing that. That that's something greater and bigger and better than anything that we could accomplish, that they could look at our lives and say, God had to do that. That's God at work. 
You see, this is our prayer as a church. This is what we believe God's placed us here to do, both collectively and in our three buildings, but, but also in our homes, in our neighborhoods, with our friends and our coworkers, that they would see the work that the Holy Spirit's doing in our lives and Jesus might be glorified. That people would see that and say, God did that. May the same be true of us. Let's pray together. Father, thank you for this time that we have this morning to be able to look again in your word and to be able to see and understand more of the Holy Spirit's role and activity in our lives. God, I pray that he would continue to expose our need for you, and as he does so, Lord, that we would be guided into the truth of the gospel, that we would continue to run to Jesus. Lord, make that true um, amongst us this morning so that the world can see your work unfolding and that you would ultimately be glorified. And we ask these things in the name of Jesus. Amen.